Great. Um, so thanks for the intro. I'm going to be talking about how we can leverage ideas from abstract interpretation to efficiently verify networks. This is joint work with Rotul Mahajan, Ardi Gupta, and David Walker. So networks uh, connect us to all of our online services and applications. And critically, hundreds of millions of people around the world depend on these uh, networks to be robust and available 24-7. Unfortunately, network errors are notoriously common and highly disruptive in practice. And um, uh, in the, the networking industry, we often refer to networks as having a large blast radius. And what that means is that they have this unfortunate property where a very small, seemingly inconsequential error can have a cascading effect and lead to massive disruptions. And this happens every couple of weeks. You can see you know, major news articles about this in uh, the industry. Oh, good point. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, so to understand why uh, these types of errors are so common and disruptive, let's take a look at how networks are operated today. So uh, in particular, let's look at one uh, common task, which is to route traffic in a network, a packet, from one point to another point. And so the, way, the most common way this happens today in industry is you buy a bunch of boxes from vendors, Cisco, Juniper, Arista, and a, a networking expert will sit down and they'll write a bunch of configuration files for these boxes. The configuration files typically say what distributed protocols are going to run uh, on the router, and they configure a bunch of low-level protocol parameters and uh, custom policy that will modify, filter uh, the messages sent between devices. So they write these configurations, they ship them to uh, the devices, and then they start executing these protocols to learn information about how to reach different destinations. Um, and the policy that the person writes might you know, filter or modify these routes, and ultimately the outcome of this will be some set of paths that, paths that are used to forward the packets through the network. And so this whole process is called the control plane, uh, and we want to verify that it's correct. As you can imagine, this is a very error-prone task because you're writing hundreds of thousands of lines of configuration, um, and you're trying to set up a distributed system that you want to work correctly. Uh, this fact has not been lost on other researchers, so there's been uh, sort of two main lines of attack to try to solve this problem. The first is control plane simulation, which is effectively just concretely executing the network and trying to proactively detect if there might be a bug. And then there's verification, which tries to exhaustively explore all concurrent executions of the protocols um, to see if any properties would be violated. And the main problem with all of these approaches is one of scalability. So if you look at, uh, for example, simulation, this is a graph showing uh, network size and routers for data center networks against the uh, simulation time on the y-axis. For a uh, popular open source uh, industrial strength uh, routing simulator. And you can see that basically there's two unfortunate properties about uh, these simulators. The first is that this is a highly nonlinear curve. So uh, you know, for under 1,000 routers, it, they can maybe handle them. But once you start getting to larger and larger networks, like ones you have at Microsoft and at Amazon and, and other cloud companies, um, this doesn't really scale. And that uses also a lot of memory. So for example, at about 600 routers, it's using 32 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and verification tools typically based on model checking or SMT solvers, scale uh, even worse, maybe up to 100 routers. So um, a lot of people have, have thought about this, this problem. And our idea was to use abstraction as a way to scale uh, this analysis. Um, so in particular, we leverage ideas from abstract interpretation uh, to prove connectivity properties of networks and to combat this complexity. And we mix some theory of abstract interpretation with a theory of routing algebras, which comes from the networking literature, to describe the, the semantics of these protocols. Uh, we studied what abstractions are effective in practice on Microsoft networks, and we built a fast tool for analyzing these. And perhaps the biggest uh, surprising result that we had um, was that uh, in our experiments on these industrial networks, uh, fairly simple abstractions, like really, really simple, um, led to very large asymptotic improvements in performance for reachability analysis with almost uh, no loss in precision. So it's a very good uh, use case for abstract interpretation. OK, so let me give a little bit of background on these routing algebras. 
Um, so routing algebra for a network, which you can view as a topology with some vertices and edges, is a five tuple. And I'll explain each of these components. So it has a set of routes. These are the messages that the routers pass back and forth. It has a merge function, which describes how routers combine messages that they learn from two different neighbors. There's a transfer function, which takes for a given edge, um, uh, gives you a new function that transforms the routes along the edge. This is typically based on the policy that the person writes and the protocol itself. There's an initial route that is the route that the uh, protocol starts with for the destination, and an invalid route, which means there's no route to the destination. So let me show an example of how a routing algebra will, will execute on a network. So here's a network with five routers, R1 through R5. And there's two host machines, one connected to R1, one connected to R5. And let's say we want to provide connectivity from R1 to R5 to R1. So a network operator configuring this network might write some configuration in, let's say, Cisco's proprietary vendor uh, format. And they're basically simple little imperative programs is the easiest way to think about them. So here, they've added a policy at R1, which is uh, filtering outbound messages. And it's saying, if it's going to be sent to R3, then we're going to add a tag in a particular protocol called BGP to the route. And then at R4, it's saying, OK, if that tag is attached for inbound routes, I'm going to override the protocol's default preference with some higher value and then allow the route through. So they're just simple little, little programs manipulating these messages. And what this is effectively doing is it's making it so that the R5 will prefer the top route in this network, maybe for cost or performance reasons. OK, so the simulation would start with every router having no route except for the destination R1. R1 would have the initial route for this protocol, BGP. And I'm showing a very simplified version here. So it has three components, a custom preference that you can set, the path that the route is taken, and a set of tags that can be attached or removed from the message. OK, and so the way this would execute is for some asynchronous schedule, R1 would send the message to R2, let's say first. Um, the transfer function would be applied, and it would update the path in this case with R1, and then merge with the no route. Um, the router will prefer to have a route over no route, so the merge function will just return the route it learned. And this will continue. So R1 might next advertise to R3. The outbound policy would be applied in the same way, except now a tag would be attached. Um, and then this would be, again, merged uh, at R3. And this would continue. So R, R4 would learn the route from R2, and then R3. And at this point, you would merge two non-trivial routes. And the way this would work in the BGP protocol is you prefer the route with the higher preference that you set uh, manually. So it will learn this route, and it will advertise to R5. And this will continue until, basically, there's no more messages left to uh, propagate. And everyone is happy with their current route. And so at the end of the day, R5 has a route to R1, and it takes this top path through the network. Now, if we want to execute this network uh, efficiently, uh, while still proving reachability between R5 and R1, we might think about using abstraction. So I'm going to uh, show that as basically an abstract protocol running on this network. So th the idea is pretty simple. I'm just writing, uh, creating an abstract message here. And it um, has two components. So I've thrown away the path. I've thrown away the preference. I just have a, a reachability marker saying there's some route. Um, I don't know what it is. And there's an abstraction for this tag, maybe true, false, it's attached, or I don't know. So I'm going to run the, this, uh, this abstract protocol now in the same way. So R2 will learn this route with no tag attached. So it knows it has some route to the destination, even though it doesn't know what that route is. Uh, R3 would learn that there's uh, some route to the destination with the tag attached. And then the same way as before, you'd get a route at R4. But now um, you don't know which one is preferred because you're not modeling the preference. So you just know that you have some route to the destination. And uh, this would continue as before. And at the end of the day, you're going to be able to show that uh, R5 can reach R1, right? even though you've actually abstracted away quite a bit of information. Um, so to show why this matters on a more realistic example, this is a data center network, which is uh, used uh, quite commonly in industry to connect large numbers of servers together. And it's shaped in a, a tree-like structure for um, performance and cost reasons. And similar to before, um, now each, each router at the bottom layer would advertise a subnet uh, for the servers below it. 
and it'll advertise a similar type of route. I've thrown away the tags for simplicity. And this will get propagated in a, a simulator and in reality um, from T0, and then a new route from T1. The path will get updated, and so on and so forth. And so it turns out that if you do this, even for a very simple data center network with no policy, uh, the complexity in terms of both time and space is n squared times square root of n. Uh, and so you can imagine that doesn't uh, scale well. Now, if we do this abstract version, um, now I've abstracted the route as just a path length. And now when I do this merge at the router, I'm going to abstract the destination um, subnet in a, a simplified form. And the, the path length will be the, the same in all cases. So it's one, then two. And for this very simple example, you can see that actually the complexity is closer to n times square root of n uh, in practice because many of these destinations are disjoint. So uh, we looked at a bunch of abstractions in practice. These are actually really quite simple. Um, we looked at abstracting different types of components of route messages like paths, tag sets, IP addresses, path sets, um, and many others we talk about in the paper. Um, in the paper, we also develop uh, eight, uh, semantics for these routing protocols, which is parameterized by an asynchronous schedule. And then we prove uh, two soundness theorems. Uh, the first is that for any fixed asynchronous schedule, an, ex an execution of the abstract algebra is sound with respect to that same execution of the concrete algebra. And then we prove a second theorem, which says that if the abstract algebra is uniquely converging, then for any asynchronous schedule, uh, an execution of the abstract algebra for that schedule is sound with respect to any other as uh, asynchronous schedule for the concrete algebra. And in particular, this uniquely converging condition uh, relies on existing literature and routing algebras that have been studied for decades. And they have all kinds of uh, conditions for when these things uniquely converge. Some are related to monotonicity. Others are re related to more uh, weak conditions, like something called a, a dispute wheel. So we, uh, we built a tool called Shapeshifter, and we ran it on 127 uh, production data center networks at Microsoft. These were data centers and um, modular components of data centers in Azure. Uh, we ran multiple, they run multiple protocols like BGP, OSPF, and many others. Uh, and they use a wide variety of features like regular expression filters, route redistribution, where you inject one routing into a different protocol, uh, preferences, tags, and many other features. There are about one to 100,000 lines of configuration per device, so tens of, of millions of lines of configuration for some networks. And they have between 10 to 1,000 routers each. So these are sort of like medium-sized uh, networks. So we looked at the precision of these uh, simple abstractions on these networks. And what we did is we, we ran the abstract simulation and uh, found how many destinations we could prove reachability for. And then we compared that with an execution of the concrete simulator, Batfish. And we computed the fraction of destinations for which we were able to prove uh, uh, that are reachable, that are actually reachable. And the interesting thing, so this is showing a CDF of the accuracy for these networks, is that um, for 95% of the networks, we could prove reachability for all destinations in the network. Um, so very little uh, loss of precision. And for the remaining 5%, we could actually prove reachability for um, the majority of, of the destinations. In terms of absolute verification time, this is showing the network sorted by size and uh, the time it takes to analyze them for uh, all asynchronous schedules um, using this abstract simulation. Uh, you can see that basically for all of the networks, it took under two minutes. And the, the orange bar here is just showing the additional verification time with a particular feature used to filter packets in the, in the, um, in the actual hardware. Uh, so in terms of the performance compared to the concrete simulation, this is showing a CDF of the speed up we get um, for these networks. And you can see that for about half of the networks, we get over 50x speed up. And about half is less than 50x speed up. And the ones that are under 50x speed up usually were the, the really small networks. So the, the bigger the network got, the bigger the improvement uh, we would get. So between maybe like one to two orders of magnitude. And with that, I will uh, summarize uh, and conclude. So um, network correctness is more important now than ever before. Um, and this is the sort of first attempt to uh, leverage abstraction for this network control plane and routing problem. Uh, we proved the soundness theorem with these routing algebras that prove soundness for all asynchronous uh, executions. 
and then we built a practical tool and evaluated it on uh, production data center networks at Microsoft. It achieves uh, high precision uh, for almost all of the networks we looked at, while uh, checking connectivity and variance orders of magnitude faster than uh, state-of-the-art tools. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, so in the absence of convergence, is it possible to uh, do something like widening in the abstract to force uh, like a convergence in the abstract domain, which would be sound? Yeah, that's a good question. We didn't um, we didn't really look at it. I think the uh, the languages from these vendors don't have any while loops, and most of the abstractions we looked at were simple finite um, uh, domains. Um, so it's entirely possible. I think it's just we didn't really run into that stumbling block um, in practice. But yeah, so it's more of a clarification question. Maybe I missed something. So when you say you prove reachability, mm -hmm. uh, do you mean unreachability? Because if you're sort of doing this abstraction, I would presume you would say something is reachable when it wasn't reachable, yeah. so maybe I... I see, so, so what we're doing that. is we're computing an over approximation of the set of routes that could be selected at a router. And then what we're saying is if that does not include the, the no route value, then we know that it, uh, it, is, it will have a route to the destination. If that makes sense. So, uh, I mean, this is really impressive. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if you have some intuition about why you're getting such a high precision. Is it because the, the routing rules are, you know, not that complicated? Is it because, yeah. you know, they don't do complicated things? So yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. Um, so I think uh, my intuition is that the way people typically configure these networks um, is that when they filter routes, they're typically, it's, it's all or nothing. So you, you either filter it uniformly or you don't. And the reason why is, let's say I, I blocked, a, I don't allow traffic on one path, but I do on a different path. That would have a very um, unfortunate fault tolerance um, property where if that one path failed, you would just lose connectivity for no reason. Um, so I think there's certain like structural things about these networks that make it um, so you don't, lose precision uh, very often. The, the occasional cases where we did lose a lot of precision was usually due, just due to features that we weren't modeling very well, like uh, regular expressions, for example. Um, they can like match on strings that are concatenated uh, by the protocols. Um, but yeah. I had one question regarding to the abstraction of tags. In the example that you have seen, that you have shown, sorry, it seemed that the tags did not matter, or am I wrong? And uh, if, uh, if so, can you give examples where the abstraction of the tag actually matters and you can have actually a precise abstraction to describe them? Yeah, that's a good observation. So in that example, um, you're right, it didn't matter. Um, in practice, we, we actually implemented two, two different abstractions, one that had tags and one that didn't. Um, the tags do increase precision a little bit because there are cases where um, like one pattern is you, you set a tag and then later you filter based on that tag. Um, and so having that extra information can help sometimes in those cases. Okay. Can, can you give examples of conditions used for filtering that you could track precisely? Sorry? Can you please give an example of uh, conditions on the tag that you could track precisely just to make it slightly more concrete? Um, so uh, an example is like in a wide area network, um, a common pattern would be when a message comes in from a neighboring network, you attach a tag, and um, later when that, network, when that uh, message goes across your network, at the egress of the network, you will check if that tag is attached or not. If the tag is attached, you will drop the route and not advertise it. For example, this prevents you from carrying traffic for free between uh, two other networks. And if the tag is attached, or is not attached, you'll let it through. Um, and so what happened is if you weren't modeling these tags, right, when the, um, when the filter says, I don't know, like drop it if the tag is attached, you'd have to assume, you know, I might have to drop, drop this route. Yeah. So, so I think your, yeah, so I think your question, 
your answer might have answered my question, which is whether you can extend your technique to make sure that there is a route from you know point A to point B, but it doesn't go through some sub network, mm. uh, which it shouldn't maybe for you know security or privacy. Yeah, conditions. yeah, so that's that exactly that? right. And in okay. the paper, we actually describe um, some abstractions for what's called waypointing, which is exactly that. Um, yeah. Okay, unless there is a one very last, very quick question, I think we are going to thank uh, Ryan again.